If you think it's just like you to over-apologize or disconnect, consider this. Those so-called quirks aren't just who you are. They're trauma responses developed as a result of narcissistic abuse. So if you're anything like me, right about now, you're wondering how many of the 10 behaviors we're about to cover relate to you personally. And since this is a bit of a heavy topic, I'd like to help you keep track of it all with a little game. Okay, everybody, hands up. Now, put a finger down if you have trouble accepting compliments. My finger's down, how about yours? We're gonna go ahead and do this for each of the signs and I'd like to know at the end if you feel comfortable sharing how many fingers were left standing for you and I'll share the same. Now back to the issue of compliments. We all struggle with this on some level, don't we? It actually even feels narcissistic to accept a compliment. But why do you think that is? Maybe it's because an actual narcissist in your life made you feel so bad about yourself that you couldn't believe someone would say something nice about you. You see, when you've been a victim of narcissistic abuse, accepting compliments or any act of kindness can stir up some complex feelings. On one hand, you're happy for the external validation, but on the other hand, you might be waiting for the other shoe to drop. This comes from a lack of self-worth and confidence. And for some of you, it may also come from experience. If you've had someone in your life who would always build you up only to knock you down later, things like compliments and kindness don't feel so safe anymore. And to get around this one, if there's no sugar coating it, it's gonna take practice. So the next time someone compliments you, observe your natural reaction and start questioning it. In order to work through these trauma responses, we have to prove their safety. Ask yourself, what's the harm in believing that someone actually meant what they said when they gave you a compliment? Or you can start with a question. Try asking every time someone compliments you, what if they're right? And you don't have to say it out loud, you can say it in your mind, but this should counter that inner voice that's telling you they're wrong or they don't mean it. And the more you do this, the more your attitude will gradually change. And here's a little quote to help reinforce that for you. The discomfort you feel from a compliment exposes the fault lines in your self-esteem. This is where the work begins. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christina and I'm a narcissistic abuse recovery coach. And if you're interested in learning more about the after effects of narcissistic abuse, I have a free checklist available in the description. So definitely check that out. All right, now let's get back to it. Put a finger down if you feel like you've lost touch with who you are. This may manifest as not knowing or enjoying the things that bring you pleasure. And you may or may not relate this back to your relationship with a narcissist. It's especially common for people who've endured narcissistic abuse as children to lose touch with their own inner identity and self-concept. And there are so many ways that this can happen. I'll give you one example right now. Imagine you're a kid and listening to your absolute favorite song in the entire world. And your parent comes into your room to tell you how stupid that song is and how they don't know how anyone in their right mind could ever like that song. It sounds like a frivolous thing, but things like that, especially done repeatedly, can be damaging to a child. Because as a child, that's when you're really developing that initial sense of self, that self-concept. And it's a really crucial time. This is why they call them the formative years. And unfortunately, this type of thing is so common with narcissists. So whether you've had a narcissistic parent or if you've encountered a narcissist in your adult life, you're definitely going to relate to this type of behavior, putting down your likes and putting down your interests. But the good news is that with distance from the narcissist's distorted feedback, you can get back to yourself again and maybe even discover new likes or dislikes without fear of being shamed for them. And we can't underestimate the importance of fostering a strong sense of who you are. A resilient sense of self is the anchor that keeps you steady amidst the changing tides of life. Now let's move on to another very serious after effect of narcissistic abuse. Put a finger down if you found yourself self-medicating with drugs, alcohol, or other destructive habits after a relationship with a narcissist. After these relationships, feelings of shame or anger can be so heavy, it's understandable to want to avoid sitting with it. So imagine someone who has suffered years of manipulation and betrayal. Now they're on their own and they feel haunted by intrusive thoughts of what they've endured. So maybe they reach for a glass of wine or a beer to quiet the racing mind. When you're doing something like this, these difficult emotions that you're numbing, they get shoved down instead of processed. For some people, it simply never feels safe to have emotions when a narcissist is around. And these coping mechanisms offer a way to numb out the painful memories or emotional flashbacks. 
But even though it's a way, it doesn't mean that it's a good way. So if you're falling into this behavior, try to make healthier choices if you can. That may be as simple as processing your feelings instead of reaching for a glass of wine. Or it may involve therapy or a support group. No matter your path to get there, I want you to know that you are worth it. Emotions are the messengers of our inner selves. Numbing them as rejecting the gifts of self-awareness, resilience, and personal evolution. Now, moving along on our list, put a finger down if you identify as a people pleaser or if you're in the habit of putting other people's wants and needs above your own. When we've been conditioned through narcissistic abuse to put everyone else's needs above our own, it makes sense that craving approval starts to feel like second nature. So imagine growing up with a parent who praises you one day for a good report card, then withdraws affection the next week over something trivial. So love starts to feel conditional for the child based on performing perfectly rather than for intrinsic reasons. So they don't feel that they can be loved simply for who they are. It's more about what they do or how they can make other people feel. So people-pleasing habits develop as sort of survival instincts. You learn that if you can please others and put other people's needs above your own, you might be able to get some conditional love or at the very least, stay out of the narcissist crosshairs. I have a video on people-pleasing that I'll link to in the card. And if you can relate and want to start setting boundaries and living more for yourself, I definitely recommend you check that one out. And this next one is definitely related. So if you put a finger down for people-pleasing, get ready to put down another. Put a finger down if you over-apologize. So basically, you say you're sorry repeatedly without needing to, almost like a reflex. And this is a habit that makes complete sense in the context of chronic criticism or blame that you may have endured at the hands of a narcissist. So imagine growing up constantly being told that everything that goes wrong is your fault. Your nervous system adapts by automatically apologizing left and right, even for totally neutral situations. Essentially, you'll find that um, the words I'm sorry start inserting themselves not from actual regret or remorse, but because it's a survival instinct that gets wired into you. And you think that it can prevent further shaming or conflict. But when we really dissect this one, we can see that it's not much different from that faux apology that we talk about with narcissists. Yes, your intentions are better than that of a narcissist who is only apologizing to manipulate you. But apologizing when you're not sorry is like painting over a crack without fixing the foundation. The problem is still there. But there's some good news, and that is that this tendency can evolve with some gentle awareness. It's definitely not an easy one to completely work out of your personality. And trust me, I know from experience. But if you can relate to this, start noticing when your apologies tend to spill out. And ask yourself, do I really bear responsibility here? Or how can I rephrase this to stand more in my worth? All right, moving on. Now let's all put one finger down if you're in the habit of walking on eggshells. If your finger's down, you've been trained to phrase things as delicately as possible to avoid upsetting a narcissist in your life. But this hypervigilance doesn't just go away when you go no contact. It takes some time for you to trust that you're safe enough with other people that you can speak freely. And this is especially true if you can relate to being a people pleaser. You see, when you're in an environment that is scary and unpredictable, the body and brain adapt in order to scan for early warning signs. You become hyper-focused on preventing further abuse by trying to avoid setting the narcissist off. So essentially, hypervigilance develops as an attempt to maintain your own personal safety. But just because this may be where you are now, it doesn't mean that this is where you'll always be. Just as your mind was trained to become hypervigilant, you can start to retrain yourself in the other direction. And mindfulness practices do help to calm things down. And over time, even healthy conflict can feel safe again. You deserve to not feel constantly under threat. Okay, so if you've been putting a finger down for every item on this list, you know exactly where we are right now. You will have three left standing. Now, put a finger down if you find yourself being easily triggered. So if you have trouble controlling your emotions based on other people's actions or words, this is you. You might get angry, sad, or frustrated and feel like you can't cope whenever someone mentions a certain topic, raises their voice, or uses a certain tone. One reason you might be easily triggered after narcissistic abuse is because you may have gotten used to defending yourself against verbal attacks around one specific subject. Another reason could be that the subject brings up a painful memory. So for example, if you were cheated on, maybe infidelity becomes a trigger for you. 
It's probably a trigger for most people, whether they've been cheated on or not. But if you've been there, you're going to be especially sensitive to it. And to be clear, I am not here to shame anyone for having triggers, even when emotions get difficult to control. But really, the ultimate goal is to be able to be unaffected by other people's words and opinions. Because I say this often, if you're easily triggered, you're easily manipulated. The very triggers put there, possibly by narcissistic abuse, are exactly what abusive people use to abuse you further. So imagine, for example, something happens and you're triggered into an angry response. It may feel like having this fight in you is protective, right? Because you feel like you're putting the other person on the defense. But if you're dealing with someone who's very abusive, what you're actually doing is exposing your own weaknesses. And I have some techniques in a video about the gray rock method that might be helpful for managing your emotions around manipulative people. So I'll link to that one in the card too. And of course, the best long-term solution to becoming less reactive is to work on the cause of those triggers and unpacking all of that. Okay, now moving along. Negative self-talk is another common effect after narcissistic abuse. So if you're in the habit of putting yourself down, it's time to drop a finger. When you're continually put down and criticized by a narcissistic abuser, it's only natural to start absorbing all of that negativity. Over time, you might notice more self-attacks creeping into your inner dialogue, almost reflexively. You're so stupid. You always mess everything up. If those phrases sound familiar, it's going to start feeling like that toxic shame that's been projected on you for so long has somehow hijacked your inner voice and your self-perception. You develop this inner critic because somehow that feels safer. It feels safer to criticize yourself before anyone else can criticize you. And the good thing is you can turn down the volume on this inner critic. As you start to disengage from the narcissist's projections over time, and then you start introducing more gentle self-talk, maybe through affirmations, you'll find that there's more room for self-acceptance in your life. This stuff definitely takes time, but I don't want you to lose hope. You have always deserved kindness from others, whether you got it or not. And you especially deserve kindness from yourself, most of all. And now we get to a difficult and very common behavior of people who've endured narcissistic abuse, and that's hiding your emotions. So when you're sad, are you likely to open up to people in your life? Or are you the type to say, nah, I'm fine and just move it along? Maybe you're always the one who takes care of other people's emotions, but wouldn't dare trouble someone with your own. If you can relate, go ahead and put that finger down now. It's that tendency we're conditioned with to feel ashamed of our emotional needs. You might even replay memories of being told things like you're overreacting or no one forced you to stay. This is all your fault. So we start apologizing for our emotions and our perfectly reasonable reactions. But the truth is, creating space to honor all your feelings without self-blame is so important after narcissistic abuse. Those criticized parts of you need empathy. So as you're recovering, try to stay patient with yourself. These things do take time and you absolutely deserve to reconnect with who you are. So now let's look at the tally. Here's where I'm at. And trust me, there's no shame in it, especially since it's worlds away from where I was even five years ago. And we can also recognize that even if we had to put a finger or two down, this system doesn't really account for how strongly we relate to these behaviors, just that the behaviors are there. So like me, you may have come a long way in, let's say, people pleasing, for example. But if it's still there, you put a finger down. It definitely doesn't mean that you're not making progress. And if you found this video helpful, you're definitely going to want to watch the video that just popped up on the screen where I talk about how and why a relationship with a narcissist actually changes your personality. But before you go, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that like button and I'll see you next time.